thought I'd finally talk about a Disney film, and what better film to start off with than Encanto, the newest Disney film from the House of Mouse. What I can say about this film from the back is that this movie is the new Frozen, in which it has one song that people like to annoy the shit out of you with, and it's overhyped as fuck. That's right, I did not care for Encanto. I thought it was meh. It's going in the meh pile, right next to Ryan the Last Dragon, Soul, Toy Story 4, and I think I'm forgetting one, but who gives a fuck? Point is, you are not missing out on much by not watching this film. That being said, however, if you do want to watch this film and you haven't seen it yet, there will be spoilers in this video for Encanto, so that's your warning, even though it has been out for a good while now. But anyway, movie centers around Family Madrigal, a Colombian family with magical gifts. Yeah, everybody can do something magical in this family, save for the men they married into the family, the grandmother, and our main protagonist, Mirabelle, or as I like to call her, Girly Potter. Don't tell me you don't see it. Mirabelle, throughout the course of the movie, struggles to come to terms with the fact that she didn't get a gift unlike her other relatives, as well as the fact that the magic in their family is slowly dying out, and she feels that it's up to her to save their magic, their miracle as they call it. And that's basically the premise of the movie. The miracle is dying and Mirabelle wants to try and prevent that. Now before I get started on why I didn't like this movie, let me just say that Encanto is not a bad movie. However, I don't think it's a good film, at least not by Disney standards. If this was DreamWorks, then yeah, yeah, sure, but Disney? Yeah, you kinda missed the mark here, buddy. So let's talk about why that is, starting with the songs of the movie. Now the songs all by themselves aren't bad, like the one they have at the beginning with Mirabelle talking about Family Madrigal, I thought that was good, and the one they had at the end where everybody was coming around to reconcile, again, that was also good. But the rest of the songs feel a little bit disjointed, like it feels like we just cut away to a new song, as opposed to the song just kinda flowing organically with the movie, like at one point, Mirabelle literally stopped the whole movie just so she can sing a song about how she is not okay that she got passed up for a gift and struggles to come to terms with that. The problem is he puts the whole movie in time out in order to convey this message through song when she could have just walked out the door and then sung her song. But instead they freeze the movie for the sake of giving us visually appealing shots, which they still could have done had they had did what I just said because in Luisa's song Surface Pressure, most of that takes place in what I can only presume is her imagination. So why not do the same for Mirror? I mean, I feel like the song would have had more impact if everything wasn't just put on stop, but hey, that's just me. But even when the film is still rolling, it still feels like these songs just kind of come out of nowhere. Like again, going back to Louisa before she sings her song, Mirabelle is just talking to her, and even Mirabelle's looking like, where the hell did this come from? Your eyes doing the thing. I'm the strong one. I'm not nervous. I'm as tough as the crust of the earth is. Okay. Now again, the songs themselves are not bad, but again, songs like Surface Pressure feel like they're shoehorned in here for the sake of giving us a song, when these issues could very easily be talked out instead of sung. And don't get me wrong, Disney has had plenty of movies where they'll have a character sing out what they are thinking or feeling, but they'll usually wait until the movie has slowed down a bit and the character is isolated, or they will burst down the song during the beginning of a montage. Or if there is some sort of cutaway, like with the Prince Ali song from Aladdin for example, then it has a much more organic flow to it, as opposed to listen to me sing this song. But other than that, it's very rare for a character to just up and burst in the song and it not feel organic to the movie. In fact, the way they treat the songs in Encanto, it's almost like they're treating them as though this is a Broadway play instead of a feature length film. Where in a Broadway play, the things that I've talked about regarding the songs are a bit more forgivable, considering the fact that there's only so much you can do in a play to maintain the audience's immersion of whatever it is they're watching. But in a film, specifically speaking a cartoon, where magic exists, the audience's expectations for what they're going to watch are going to raise up a bit and so they have to do better at firing on all cylinders, which don't get me wrong, no movie is perfect. Even the greatest of all movies is not perfect. And I'm not asking for perfection, but what I am asking for is consistency. Now if Encanto was a Broadway play, then I'd be a bit more forgiving with how the songs are done. But because it's a movie and not a play, I expect a little more from it, especially since there are Disney films 
films that handle the singing portion of the films a lot better. But moving on, let me talk about some of my gripes with the movie from a storytelling perspective. So for starters, Mirabelle did not receive a gift unlike her siblings and her extended family. And again, she is visibly upset about this throughout the entirety of the film, save for the ending where everything is resolved. The thing here is there are also three other ordinary people in her family. Her uncle, her dad, and her grandma. And none of these people tried to help her with the fact that she has no real extraordinary talent. I feel like her grandmother the most would be able to help her out in this regard, considering how the miracle started with her, but she's just an ordinary woman. And I understand that she went through a traumatic experience in the past, and that the lesson she needed to learn in the present day was that she needed to prioritize her family over their miracle, but the point that I'm trying to get to is that a lot of problems, if not all the problems in this movie, could have easily been resolved by simply talking. You mean to tell me 50 years have passed since that event and nobody has ever had a serious one-on-one -on -one with Abrela? Like nobody's ever wanted to have a discussion with this woman? I mean, I can understand that sometimes it can be hard to talk about things, whether it's you stressing out about something in the present day or dealing with trauma that happened in the past, but still, you guys had an easy solution to these problems, but just never used it because up until Mirabelle, nobody's had the balls to step up to Abrela and just air some things out. Like seriously, them having a conversation would have prevented quite a lot in this film. There is no greater example of that than the character of Bruno. Now, throughout the first half of the film, Bruno is treated as though he's the equivalent of Lord Voldemort. Nobody likes him, nobody wants to be around him, they don't even want to speak his name. Come to find out later on in the film, Bruno is actually a pretty cool guy who went into self-isolation within the house of Madrigal due to the fact that people didn't like him because he predicted bad futures. Like that's his power, seeing into the future. The only problem is he's not predicting a future that people want to see. And apparently that's enough for people to badmouth and shame him from the townsfolks to even his own family. And the futures that he was predicting weren't even like super bad futures either. Like okay, it rained on Peppa's wedding day, so fucking what? Like I get that the bride especially wants everything to go well during her wedding day, but still if all you had to deal with was the rain, then I don't feel like that's enough for you to make your own brother the family outcast. And then his other predictions include things like predicting a lady's goldfish would die, or a guy would get fat, or a dude would go bald. And keep in mind these are the only quote unquote bad things Bruno has done, but when you really think about it and you listen to the Bruno song, you kind of get the feel that these problems prophecies were self-fulfilling and could have been prevented had people taken proper measures. For example, when Peppa is talking about how a hurricane happened on her wedding day, what she says before that is, before it was a clear sky and then Bruno came, said it looked like rain, and the hurricane was most likely caused by Peppa herself, who is easy to set off, especially considering that that is one of the biggest days of her life. But again, because of these minor inconveniences, Bruno, who is not a bad guy, is seen like this boogeyman by basically everyone who isn't Mirabelle or Antonio, but hey, I guess it's just easier to point fingers than to discuss things, so might as well just continue with what works. But another thing that bugged me about this movie is how inconsistent things can feel at times. Like getting back to Bruno, at the end of the movie, everybody just loves him, and I don't understand why, because after having a whole song badmouthing this dude, he suddenly comes back and everybody's just like, oh, it was just one big misunderstanding. Welcome back, Bruno. It's not even an emotional reunion, like they were waiting for him to come back or anything like that. He's just welcome back as though he took a trip for like two days and then came back. But this dude's been gone for 10 years and nobody had anything good to say about him. And again, the things that people were mad at Bruno about were pretty petty things to be mad about, especially considering that he just predicted what would happen. But he doesn't even get so much in an apology. In fact, they act almost as though nothing has happened. I get that they want to be about family and unity, but come on, at least somebody act like a crucial part of the family has been gone for a decade. I mean, he wasn't gone gone, but still, he wasn't welcomed. Another thing I found odd was the cracks in the house symbolizing how the miracle was dying. Like we first see the cracks at the beginning of the film after Mirabelle gets done singing her song and she promptly tries to tell her family that hey something is wrong you better take a look. So everybody goes out of Antonio's room, they look at the house to see that it's perfectly fine. Even Mirabelle can see that nothing is wrong. And so Mirabelle ends up looking crazy and everybody goes back to what they were doing. A little while later we find Abdullah talking to her late husband about how their magic is dying and so that has me to believe that she did know that something was going on and chose to throw her own granddaughter under the bus. Like I can understand wanting to save face in front of all those people, but why not at the very least let your family know what's going on? I mean would that be too much to ask? And later on in the film the cracks are visible to everyone so everybody should know that Mirabelle was actually on to something, but nobody ever brings that fact up. They're just kind of living with the cracks and hopefully the house doesn't break. Also how do the 
those tracks worked anyway? Are they just tied to Mirabelle's emotional state? Is her power just making sure the house stands up straight? And how does losing the magic work exactly? Because while characters like Luisa and Camilo were losing their magic no doubt, characters like Bruno and Antonio were able to use their powers just fine. At least until the house does eventually collapse and everybody does lose their magic. Kinda convenient, but whatever. The characters themselves aren't anything to write home about either. Like Mirabelle's mother and father are basically non-existent outside of the mother occasionally healing somebody with food and the father being a visual gag. Luisa and Isabel are basically Poison Ivy and the Hulk respectively, and they're really the only two characters that feel the pressure of Dora Blayla being so tightly wound. I mean, Mirabel does too towards the end, but up until the point where she airs out her grievances, it really just felt like Mirabel was bummed out over the fact that she doesn't have a power and feels less special in the family because of it. Not necessarily because of her grandmother, but because of her own personal insecurities. And yeah, Bruno did also leave, but that wasn't a Blayla's fault. He left because everybody kept badmouthing him because of his predictions that he cannot control, but still gets villainized for. Dolores is basically there just to look pretty. Antonio's only real point in the story is to rub in the face of Mirabel that she doesn't have a gift, as well as give Bruno some space for him to do his prophecy on Mirabel, letting her know that she is in fact the main protagonist of this story, because up until then Mirabel has basically been taking it upon herself to try and fix the miracle, with little reason for why it has to be her, and no real clue as to what she is doing. Peppa is Peppa, I guess? Felix can be taken out of the movie entirely and nothing changes. I like Camilo though, he's cool. I've already talked about Bruno and Lil, so I'm not gonna reiterate. Now the grandmother character confuses the hell out of me, and quite a few people justify her actions due to her traumatic experience in the past, so let's look at that before I go into her character. So back in her heyday, Alma was married to a man named Petro and had three children with him. That of course being Peppa, Julieta, and Bruno. And then everything changed after their village was raided by what I can only assume are the servants of Sauron, and we can also assume that many people died. Alma and her family do manage to escape, but the riders are right on their tail. So Petro decides that he's gonna step up and try to stop them the best he can while everybody else can escape, resulting in Petro's death. It also results in the miracle happening that blasts away the riders and presumably kills them, and it's the source of the Madrigal's magic. Now the coming of the riders, her losing her home to the riders, as well as her husband, was pretty horrible to go through. The problem is, what happened to her in the past doesn't reflect on her in the present all that well. Like she wants to save the miracle for the sake of her family, and if her fear is that if the miracle isn't saved the house is gonna collapse, I can understand that. But why was it at the beginning she was trying to keep it a secret that their magic was dying? Wouldn't you want to make that a priority amongst your other family members? And even when the magic dying isn't a secret, she still doesn't want to make it a priority. She just somehow believes that with everything going off perfectly, the magic can be saved, even though there is no evidence to support that. She's also just constantly projecting on Mirabelle as to her being the reason that the magic is dying, even though again, no evidence to support that claim. Like, Abuela does not come across as a person with PTSD, but rather just a crotchety old lady. Like again, she wants to protect the magic at all costs, and if her reasoning for wanting to do that is to make sure that the house doesn't collapse on everybody, I can understand that. However, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like she wants to protect the magic for the sake of protecting the magic. I mean, after all, there is no threat or implication that those riders that raided her village all those years ago will come back, and nobody's trying to leave the village, so the house is really the only thing in consequence which doesn't feel that consequential through the eyes of Ablula. Like, don't get me wrong, what happened to her in her younger years was sad, but it's not connecting all that well to the present day. Now, there is a way to have a character handle PTSD and do it effectively in a story. I mean, just look at Finding Nemo. Marlin also went through a tragic experience in the past, and that's what makes him the way he is in the present time. But here, I just don't feel it. Needless to say, the grandmother was not my favorite character. So let me talk about Mirabelle for a moment, because I like the concept of Mirabelle being powerless, yet at the same time being the glue that holds the family together. Like helping a nervous Antonio when it's his turn to receive his gift, bringing Bruno back into the family, understanding Luis Lisa, reconciling with Isabella, and helping her grandmother see reason. So I thought she had a really interesting dynamic with all her family members, one that I could have appreciated a lot more had it not been for how the movie ends. Like, the film's ending was almost beautiful. Almost. I would have even bumped up the movie two points had they had stuck to their guns with how I thought the movie was going to end. So near the end of this film, right, the magic has died out, everybody's powerless, and the house is in ruins. But it's okay though because they all come together as a family and talk about how they're more than just their gifts, and I really like that as a concept. I also like the fact that all the villagers came by to help them rebuild their home. Like, that was wonderful. And it would have been a really nice ending had they had just 
stayed powerless, yet they were a family united regardless of this. But then they ruin it by having everybody just get their powers back at the end anyway. Keep in mind, they're not saving the world with these gifts that they have. They're just kind of doing odd jobs around their community, if that. And when you really think about it, these powers did more harm than good to most of the people they were bestowed upon. Like Luisa felt like she was going to be virtually useless without her power due to the immense pressure of being the big strong tough one. Isabella always felt like she had to be this pinnacle of excellence and could never properly express herself. Peppa could literally kill this whole family depending on her mood swing. While Dolores isn't much of a character in the film, I doubt that her power hasn't gotten on her nerves from time to time. Like she said that she could hear Luisa's eye twitching. So you can only imagine all the other stuff that she's able to hear unintentionally. Like when her parents are having sex for example. So needless to say, I doubt she'd be too broken hearted about never being able to hear that again. And do I even need to bring up Bruno and how much shit he got for his gift again? I mean you want me to believe that these people are more than just the gifts that they've been given. But by giving them their gifts back, that message is kind of lost in the echo. Like the ending would still be a happy ending, they just wouldn't have their abilities. But now it just feels a little undermined and we got the film that we got. Now like I said before, this movie isn't a bad movie, but it isn't up to par to what we have known Disney to do in the past. In fact, I feel like this movie could have been great up there with movies like Coco had they just put a little extra work behind it. Because there are things to like about the film, they're just not well put together. The main reason I wanted to talk about this film in particular was because I feel like this is the quality we can expect from modern day Disney going forward, which is a shame because you shouldn't have to settle for a mediocre movie when you know they can do better and they have done better before. But lately it feels like Disney has been losing its own magic, producing subpar films that, while they do have great concepts, are not fleshed out as well as they should be. But who knows, maybe Disney's next film will knock it out of the park. Lightyear looks promising, and then there's also, um, oh, well, um... Let me know what you guys think. Did you like Encanto? Did you not like Encanto? Does Disney still have the magic? Are they losing the magic? Post your opinions down in the comments below. As always, support your emperor by leaving a like and clicking subscribe. Also, follow me on these social media platforms. You wouldn't want to commit treason now, would you?